Okay, let's talk about functions of continuous random variables. So we've seen a little bit of this. So we've worked out the expected values of functions of continuous random variables, but we kind of avoided calculations about, say, if I take a function of a continuous random variable, what's the PDF of the new random variable? And the reason we avoided it so far is it's a little bit trickier than the discrete case. The discrete case is really about remapping how point masses of probability are uh, distributed, whereas here you have to be quite a bit more uh, careful in your calculations. Okay, but let's go through it case by case, and let's just try to see some examples of how this works out. Um, the main thing I want you to keep in mind is that there are some basic principles you can follow that are you know, pretty simple. It's just that the calculations themselves can get a bit annoying and tedious. Okay, so you'll see that as we go along. Okay, so let's let x be a continuous random variable and let y be um, a function of that random variable. So let's say g of x. Okay, so depending on the choice of this function, we might not actually end up with a continuous random variable. We might actually have a discrete random variable. We might have a continuous random variable or a mixed random variable. And I'll define that on the next page. Okay, so let's do an example. So let's say that x is a continuous random variable between minus 2 and 2, and it's uniform. Okay, so it's uniform minus 2, 2. And let's say y1, I just take it to be the function g1 of x, which is going to be x squared. In this case, it's going to be continuous. Okay, y2 is g2 of x, which is going to be plus 1 whenever x is greater than 0 or equal to 0 and 0 otherwise. And this final one is going to be keeping the value of x whenever x is non-negative, okay? And it's going to be 0 whenever it's negative. So it's thresholding it a little bit. So this middle one here is discrete. There are two possible values, and I just have a range where each of them um, is applied. This top one is continuous because I've just kind of warped this uniform random variable, and this bottom one is actually mixed because I have a combination of a point mass and a continuum. Okay, so let's get on with some definitions. So that was just an example to give you a flavor for what these things look like, but let's define this a bit more. So remember, uh, Discrete random variable has a CDF which is piecewise constant with a countable set of discontinuities. Okay, so what does that look like? Well, it's basically, it has a PMF that jumps these up by a little bit. So remember that we have these flat areas and then it kind of jumps up by the value of the probability mass function or the PMF at the points in the range. Okay, so um, this is something that we've seen before. That's a discrete random variable. Continuous random variable. So a CDF is going to be continuous, and it's also going to be uh, differentiable everywhere except for a countable set of positions. Okay, and in this case, we know that we can work with the PDF. So I can take the derivative, and I get the PDF. So here's a plot of the CDF. It's continuous, and I can also kind of visually see that there's going to be a derivative at every point because it's smooth here. All right, and um, mixed. So the CDF is going to be continuous, but it's going to be allowed to have a countable set of discontinuities, and it's also got to be differentiable everywhere except for a countable set of positions. Okay, so it's easier to uh, show you what this looks like. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. And, you know, and this is before I say that, uh, let me just say that. If you've taken um, a course like signal processing, so signals and systems, you're familiar with the delta function, and you can use the delta function to generalize the notion of a PDF and capture these discontinuities in the um, CDF in that way. But that's beyond the scope of this course. So if that doesn't make sense to you, just set it aside. All right, so just forget about it. Here's a picture. So this is kind of the main thing that you should see. So it's continuous, and then it sort of jumps up a few times. So it's kind of a mixture of discrete because of the jumps, and continuous because in all the other places it's just smoothly varying. Mostly these mixed random variables are beyond the scope of this course, but I'm including just them just for completeness. Okay, so we're not really going to run into this too many times, but just so that you can see um, what happens with a continuous random variable when you apply a function, it's not always as simple as it becoming discrete or continuous. It could also become a mixed random variable. Okay, well, we'll leave that... Um, We'll leave that aside. So we won't really do any um, examples of that. I'm just pointing out that you do have to check 
whether it's discrete or continuous. So let's do continuous to discrete. So if the function that you're given, g of x, if that function is a piecewise constant function, then y, which is equal to g of the random variable x, will be a discrete random variable. Its range will be a list of values. And to determine the PDF, PMF of y, because it's discrete, you take each value and you determine the set of x values from the real line that get mapped into this value y. So you have the set ay, which is the set of x in the real line, for which the function maps them into this point y. That's the real line. Okay, and then the PMF value at y is just obtained by integrating the PDF of x over ay. So I take the integral over ay of the PDF of x. Okay, so I see how much probability aggregates into that point. Easier to see through an example. So let's just say that x is going to be uniform and it's going to be between 0 and 3. Okay, and let's draw the PDF. So the PDF is going to just be a box and it's going to be of height 1 third, so it normalizes to 1 because it's of width 3. Okay, and the function I'm interested in is going to be 0 and it's going to be 0 when s is less, x is less than or equal to 1 and 1 when x is greater than 1. Okay, so there's this region a0 and this region a1, which I've drawn in red and purple. Okay, so there's going to be this red area, and that's going to be the probability that gets mapped into zero. Okay, so I, I'm going to try to figure out the probability that gets mapped into zero is the integral over a0 of the PDF, and that's just going to be a third, because that's the area of this box lying above a0. Then there's also going to be the probability of 1. That's the remaining probability in this case. So that's going to be 2 thirds, but we can just calculate it's the integral over a1 of the PDF, and so that's going to be 2 thirds. Okay, so I'm going to get this uh, stem plot of 1 third and 2 thirds, and here we go. Okay, so that's simple. I mean, you can just imagine scenarios where it's a bit annoying to do these, you know, piece uh, kind of regions of integration, but the idea is pretty simple and you can just carry it out. Okay, let's look at continuous to continuous functions. So now um, let's say that I have a function g of x and the function itself is continuous and I have the additional guarantee that its derivative is not going to be zero for any interval, okay? So then y equals g of x will be a continuous random variable. And what I mean by on any interval, it's okay to cross zero but you can't stay at zero for any length, okay? So you can't have a function g that becomes flat at zero for some time and then comes back up or down. So it can cross zero, but it has to keep going. All right, in that case, y is gonna be continuous. So let's first determine the CDF, okay? So we're gonna figure out the CDF of y. And so for what we're gonna do for each y in the real line, we're gonna determine the set of values such that g of x is less than or equal to y. Okay, so I'm gonna come up with this set by, which are the x such that g of x is less than or equal to y. Okay, so then the CDF value at y is just the integral of the PDF over this set by. Okay, that's how I get the PDF of y. Okay, and then I just finally take the derivative to get the PDF. So the point of this whole uh, exercise is that in order to understand the PDF of a function of a continuous random variable, then I should first get the CDF. That is the simplest and um, clearest way to go, okay, if you're trying to do it from first principles. So first get the CDF, then take the derivative to get the PDF. Let's do an example. Okay, let's say that x is going to be an exponential 2 random variable. Okay, so lambda is equal to 2. And I want y to be just a half times x. So that's a very simple function. You know, it's just a line. It's not going to have any interval on which is zero. It only crosses zero in one place. Okay, so then what is by going to be? It's the set of x such that g of x, in this case, half times x, is less than or equal to y. So I can rewrite that as the set where um, x is less than or equal to 2y. And so then I understand what I should be doing to get the CDF. I'm integrating over this set by. So here I go. I integrate from minus infinity up to 2y of the PDF. And in fact, that's just like plugging in 2y into the CDF of x. Okay, in this special case. 
for this example. So now I just take the derivative. Okay, so I take the derivative of the CDF and I'm gonna plug in what I got. So I plug in this formula in terms of the CDF of X. And so I'm just gonna get two PDF of X, two Y, right? So this is just the derivative propagating inside the function. It spits out the two and then I get this answer, two F of X, two Y, all right? So what I'm doing is just scaling up the PDF of x by two and also kind of inflating it inside by this two y. All right, so looking at the PDF for an exponential two random variable, I have two to the e to the minus two x when x is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so for f of y, then I'm just gonna get um, four e to the minus four y when y is greater than or equal to zero and zero otherwise. Okay, so it's again, going to be an exponential random variable, but now we can see that the parameter became four instead of two. And that was the effect of dividing by one half. All right, let's look at some special cases. So one special case is going to be, uh, okay, special cases for continuous to continuous random variables. So let's say the function is strictly monotonic. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, let me just draw it for you. So I can be monotonically increasing, which means I'm always going up and monotonically decreasing, which means I'm always going down. Okay, so always going up and always going down, meaning that I never stay flat and I never go in the opposite direction. So I can speed up and slow down, but I have to always be making progress either up or down. That is a strictly monotonic function. In that case, I have a very nice simple formula. Okay, maybe not that simple, I'll write it down. The new PDF of Y is the PDF of X, and I plug in this H of Y, and I also multiply by the absolute value of the derivative of h of y. What is h of y? h of y is the inverse of the function that I actually want when I'm plugging in y. So the reason I just write in terms of h of y instead of writing the inverse function is just that it's not so confusing uh, when I take this derivative, right? So it's just a little bit of uh, substitution. But if you wanted, you could have written f of x g inverse y and then the derivative of g inverse y. Okay, easier again to see through an example, so we're going to do that. So let's take that um, x is uh, uniform, and it's going to be 0, 1. And let's say uh, g of x is minus 1 over lambda, uh, the log of x, natural log of x. Okay, so if I plot this g of x, it just turns out that it's monotonically decreasing. So you can pick up your favorite plotting software and just check that that's the case. So it's just going down all the time, okay? on the, and it's kind of starting at zero and just going down and slowing down, but always going down. Okay, so what is the inverse function of g? It's h of y, which is the inverse function of y. So it's e to the minus lambda y, right? So you can get that by moving the minus one over lambda to the other side and taking the exponent of both sides. So what is the absolute value of the derivative? I need that as well. So that's the absolute value of minus lambda e to the minus lambda y. So it's just lambda e to the minus lambda y. So then the PDF is going to be the PDF of x plugging in this h of y, right, times lambda e to the minus lambda y, okay? And I'll just note that this thing here is going to be one if, um, if so basically remember that this is a uniform random variable. So for a uniform random variable, when I plug in, if I'm in the range between zero and one in this case, then I get one. And if I'm outside the range, I get zero, okay? So if e the minus lambda y is between zero and one, I get one. So that's going to happen if y is greater than or equal to zero. So this term is just going to enforce that y is greater than or equal to zero. So I finally get that it's lambda e the minus lambda y when y is greater than or equal to zero and zero otherwise, right? So that's what happened with this first term. It just enforced these two cases. And what I see is that in this case, this function changes the uniform random variable to an exponential lambda random variable. Okay, one more special case. So uh, let's say I just want a linear function or really an affine function. So it's not linear because we've been calling this linear sometimes in this course, but it's technically affine because I have this constant shift. So if you wanna be particular about it, it's not quite linear because it's not ax, it's ax plus b. But we've been saying that's linear, so we'll just kind of, um, we might do that interchangeably. All right, so then um, 
f of y is just 1 over the absolute value of a, then I take the pdf of x and then take y minus b over a. Okay, so this is an easier thing to work out. And in fact, if x is a Gaussian random variable, okay, and it has some parameters, and y is a linear function or affine function of x, then y is also going to be Gaussian and only the parameters are going to change, right? And to work out the parameters, I can just use linearity of expectation. So I get a mu plus b, and I can use the variance of a linear function and I get a squared sigma squared. Why is this true? Well, if I write out the PDF of a Gaussian, which I'm going to do now, so here's the PDF of x, which is a Gaussian random variable, then I can apply this formula that I just wrote down for you above for general random variables, right? So I'm going to apply that formula. So I'm dividing by the absolute value of a, and I'm plugging in y minus b over a, right? So I'm just plugging in, and then I'm uh, pushing a into the square root, so I get a squared, and then I'm just rearranging some terms here. So I get the mean of y and I get the variance of y. So I actually see that the mean of y and the variance of y show up where they should for the PDF of a Gaussian random variable with those parameters. So that makes sense. So it's easy to see that using the formula above. Okay, a couple more examples and then we're done. So let's say x is a uniform one, two random variable. Okay, so in this case, x it's going to have the PDF 1. Okay, so it's going to have the height 1 between 1 and 2, and otherwise it's going to be 0. And let's say y is a linear or affine function, so it's going to be, in this case, minus 3x plus 4. Okay, so I'm going to use this formula. So what is a? Well, I'm going to divide by 1 over the absolute value of minus 3, so 3, and then I plug in y minus 4 over minus 3, right? And so then I'm going to get a third when one when y minus four over minus three is between one and two. And now I'm just going to move these terms over the other sides of the inequalities to get something more like what I'm used to. Let's move the uh, minus three over. So when I get the minus three, I kind of flip the inequality. So I get minus six and minus three. Okay, and then I'm going to move the four over. So I'm going to get um, plus four on both sides of the inequalities. So I'm going to get um, minus 2 up to 1, okay? And this makes sense. So I'm basically now getting a uniform random variable between minus 2 and 1. So it's just shifted over and rescaled. Finally, if V is a Gaussian 1, 2 random variable, I don't even need to do that. I can use this fact that Gaussians stay Gaussian under linear transformations. So I'm going to take the same transformation. I'm just going to work out the mean of W. So it's minus 3 times 1 plus 4, right? And the variance is going to be minus 3 squared times 2. So then W is going to be um, Gaussian 118, right? So the mean and variance I just calculated and I just plugged them in. So this is, again, a fact that we're going to be seeing a lot of. I think this last thing is the most important out of everything we've seen. So if you remember one thing, it should be this. Linear functions of Gaussian random variables are themselves Gaussian.